So last time, what were we talking about? Uh, isomers and uh, inorganic. Yep, we were talking about isomerism. And we discussed, I think, three or four of them so far. So can you tell me what types of isomerism we have talked about so far? Linkage. Yep, we have linkage. What else? Ionization. Yeah. Other one? Coordination. Did we get to any more of them? No. I don't, I don't think so. Could you describe like the differences between these or what they are? Um, linkage is they're isomers, but uh, ligands are bonded through different atoms. Yes. Yep. So it's the ligand. The ligand just changes which atom it's bonding through. Ionization isomerism. Um, ions just switch places. I guess. Yeah, basically. So if you have a chlorine, it'll switch places with a bromine or something. Uh, coordination isomerism. The ligand metal ratio is the same, but the ligands change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like they swap partners, the oxidation state of the metal usually changes too. Um, but you're right, the, the ligand to metal ratios are all staying the same. Okay, next, the one that we're going to discuss is hydrate isomerism. So we've talked about hydrates a little bit before. And I think, Maddie, you gave me an example of a hydrate. Does anybody, can anyone describe like what a hydrate is or do you know the identity of a hydrate? Isn't that like kind of the idea that there's water interlocked with the molecule? Yeah, like the water is stuck in a lattice. Yeah. Well, okay. Upper hydrate cool. is a common one. Yeah, the, and how do you like, how do you make something that's a hydrate and anhydride, or excuse me, an anhydrate or anhydrous? You put, you put like a dot and then however many molecules of water are in the said lattice. Oh, I mean like experimentally, how do you, how do you make oh. a hydrate turn to an anhydrous form? Um, you put it in a desiccator yeah. or you heat it up. Yeah, exactly. So, so knowing that, what do you think hydrate isomerism is? But remember, we're talking about ligands, right? So a hydrate, what's that telling us? Talking about water. Yeah, we got water. The water is switching. from being a ligand to an occupant in the crystal lattice. From a ligand to an occupant within the crystal structure. So just like Christmas, we're gonna use x for <laughs> okay, so an example of this uh, is if you look at CrCl3 in solution. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to keep track of the complex and we're going to keep track of its color. Okay, so we got Cr H2O6, Cl3. Then the water is going to exchange with these chlorine ligands. And we get Cr Cl H2O5.
Cl2, H2O4, Cl. Okay, and the violet, it's cool to watch this reaction. If I can get back to the lab, I'll actually, I'll do this for you guys. You can shift the equilibrium by adding more chlorine, causing this to happen. This looks like a violet color. Or if we oxidize this, this chromium, it'll change colors too, so we can toss in some hydrogen peroxide. You guys did something similar back in Gen Chem where you were looking at manganese complexes and they changed colors to them. So this one's violet. Can you guess what color this guy is? Blue. Yep, blue green. Then as we oxidize it more, what color do you think we're gonna get? Yellow maybe? No, dark? Close. <laughs> no, it just gets darker? Red. Okay. Yeah, we just go to a dark green. But we are shifting towards that part of the spectrum. So everybody can see how that ligand is, like those chlorines are moving from the outside to the inside, right? Now the question is, we forgot the hydrate parts, so we need to include some dots. So how many waters should I have in this middle one? Just one. Yep, second one. Two. Or excuse me, third one. Yep, two is right. Wait, why are we doing that? So, the ligands moved, so if you look in this system, the ligands were originally attached to, or excuse me, the waters were ligands attached to the chromium, right? And then these guys were counter ions, they were just hanging out. Now the chlorines are starting to go and actually interact with the chromium. So those, those waters have to go somewhere. And where they go, they, they go into the crystal lattice. They're kind of exchanging spots with those counter ions. So for example, if we were to draw this guy out, what type of what type of geometry is this system going to have? Um, is that going to be an octahedral? Yep, it's octahedral. Okay, and what am I forgetting on here if I want to describe this form formula? Charge. Yep, what's the charge on the chromium? It'll be three plus. Yep. And then, so this is what the, what the molecular unit looks like, that bit that's in this parenthesis, like those brackets. And then the chlorines are just sort of hanging around to stabilize the charge. Okay, now when these ligands exchange with one another, If you look back at this formula, CrCl2O5 Cl2 dot water. What happens to the oxidation state of the chromium? It'll be plus two. Yep. And what about this other junk that we didn't write down? Where is that stuff? Outside. Yeah. 
So it's hanging around. It, it'll be more three-dimensional, like a crystal lattice. I just don't have a good picture of it. But that's an example of it. Does that make more sense? Okay, cool. So we got that idea of isomerism down. Let's hop to the next one. I have one that you've heard before, at least in uh, organic chemistry. Stereoisomerism. Ism. We'll add that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's a stereoisomer? Something that has like the same exact molecular formula, but has different bonds. Right. So in this case, when we're talking about ligands, how are we going to modify our definition? Um, the chiral centers, so there'll be an inverse. I'm sorry, Josh, can you say you're, that one more time? You'll have chiral centers. Um, I'm going to read you. Not necessarily chiral. Yeah, because like chiral is very specific to stereoisomer, right? Yeah, yeah, like you could have E and Z. Like, this includes oh, trans and okay. cis and yep. everything, right? Like this yep. is like the broad term. Yep. So how are we going to define it for our metal complexes? So is the, is so the, the change of position of the molecule? Yep. Uh, when you say molecule, what do you mean? Uh, atom or comp ligand. Yes, yeah. the change. There we go, ligand. Position. That's the word I was looking for. So same ligands, but different arrangements. Okay, so this includes things like you guys already talked about, cis trans isomerism and chiral isomers. Okay, so an example of this, cis and trans di amine dichloro platinum two. What a name. Come on. Focus thing. You can do it. There we go. I think there's just too much white. I have to switch to like yellow paper or something. <laughs> okay. So what are those going to look like based upon that name? It's going to be a platinum where you are trans, so it'll be on one side, you'll have well, both. Before you AMs answer that, is it gonna, what type of complex is it going to be? Oh, it'll be tetrahedral. No, no, it'll be square planar. It could be tetrahedral or it could be square planar. Since you see cis and trans, that usually gives the hint that it's square planar. Yeah. So, this guy, what does that mean in terms of its dimensionality? How many dimensions do we really need to describe this structure? Just one, or it's 2D. Yep, it's 2D, flat. So let's do the trans one. What are our ligands that we got? Just got two amine groups and two yep. coral groups. Okay, do I need to put a charge on this complex? No. No. Yep, that's right. Platinum's got a two. The chlorines are minus one each. So this one's the trans form. This form is just with the ligands on the same side, right? Yep. Okay. Octahedral complexes can have this too. 
let's look at another example, cis and trans, tetra, amine, dibromo, cobalt, two. Okay, what type of, any? can anyone tell me the formula for this guy? Um, NH3,4,Br2, and then CO. Yep. Okay, what type of complex is this going to be? Octahedral. Okay, can anyone describe to me a cis form or a trans form of this one? Yeah. So it's all gonna be about axial position. So I believe that the cis form is gonna have both uh, bromos and the axial positions mm -hmm. and then your I mean, groups are going to go around it, oh my whereas goodness. the trans will have one of the bromo groups in the equatorial positions. So like this. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Nope. There we go. All right, focus thing. Yep, like that. Okay, which one's the cis, which one's the trans? I'm guessing that the left one is the trans. Mm -hmm. And this guy is? Cis. That no, so could go on any of those positions that are along that one plane, right? Right. Any ones that are two, right, any bromines that are right next to one another. So you could also represent it this way. Right? Mm -hmm. Because what's the bond angle between, approximate bond angle between any of the, any two adjacent ligands? Uh, 90? Yeah, about 90. And what about like from um, that bromine to that amine? That's 180. Yeah. So if they have different bond angles associated with them, then they're different structures. So in this case, what's the bond angle between bromiums? Uh, 180. Yep, 180. What about in the cis form? Just 90. Yep, it's 90. No matter what, what bromine you look at or what position they're at, in the cis form, they should be 90 degrees away from one another. Okay. All right, and now we have to add a little more complication to this, right? Because um, in organic chemistry, you usually only have, you know, four, three or four um, functional groups bonded to an atom. In this case, we can have many different ligands bonded to a single atom. So let's talk about uh, face and murder. Like you should just call nice it a picture system. Okay, so these are complexes that have the following generic formula. Four complexes with the formula. 
M, which stands for the metal, we have ligand one, which we're going to call A, ligand two, which we have P. And is there are a new type of, is this a new type of uh, isomer? Or is yep, this is a new type of isomer, isomerism. So like how you label a product cis then? and tran, trans, you can have a face and mer isomer. Does that make sense? Oh, so, but it's still considered under stereo in the Bible. Yep, I'm sorry, can you say it one more time, Josh? It's still considered under stereoisomerism. Yes, it's still stereoisomerism. Okay. If three ligands are on the same triangular face, that's called a face isomerism. If three ligands on the same triangular face, That's the face isomer. If three ligands are in the same plane, that's bisecting. The molecule or complex, that's called the mer isomer. Oh, does that say mu A3B3 or M A3B3? Oh, that's, sorry, that's meant to just be M for like okay. generic metal, not not bridging like, <laughs> sorry, I'm so used to writing my M's that way it looks a little mu -y. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're coming up with new adjectives, I guess. Okay, can I um, can I move this up a little bit? Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. No. Okay. Let me know when I can move. Is that supposed to be triangular or trigular? <laughs> oh, that's that's meant to be triangular. <laughs> and how do I have it written in my notes? I just get excited. <laughs> yep, I just can't, can't read, that's all. <laughs> so it says three ligands are in the same plane and then something bisecting molecule? Yep, same plane that's bisecting the molecule. Okay. So like in the octahedral is like probably the best case that we're talking yes. about here, which is they're yep. all going to be octahedral, I'm guessing. But. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to draw a couple structures so this will sink in a little bit more, okay? Or, well, we're going to draw some structures. Am I okay to move this up? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So, example EO NH3 EL3. Before we do anything, let's get the name of this compound. What's its name? Um, Triamid. With two M's. Mm -hmm. Trichloro cobalt three. Yep. You should be at the point where you can look at those those formulas and just spout off the name. If there's some complicated uh, ligand in there, yeah, it can take up a little bit more time because you have to look it up, but you should be pretty good at that. Okay, let's try to describe these. And then we got the other one. Okay, so if you see there's a different arrangement between these ligands, what is the bond angle between any two chlorines? 
in this structure, the one on the left. Yep. What about in this one? What what are the bond angles? 90. Yep, we got 90 between these two or these two. What about between the the wedge and the dashed one? It's 180. Yep, 180. Okay, now we have to decide which one is the face and which one's the mer isomer. Anybody have any idea? Face is to the right. Draw this. <laughs> 50-50 shot. No, uh, face is to the right. No? That one's the mer. <laughs> is, that, is the chlorine not on the same plane? The chlorines are all on the same plane. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the other one just makes the face anyways. So. Yeah. Face, remember, face is on the same triangular face. Oh, same triangular face. I'm thinking, like, I thought I'm on the same plane. All right. Yep. So if we were to draw out a little triangle, these bonds don't exist. I'm just going to draw them in purple. There's one triangular face. And there's the other triangular face. Does that make sense? Whereas with this cobalt, it's, it's cutting, cutting the molecule in half. Okay, so in my experience, what it, what's easier to do is, is to look to see if it's a face isomer. If it's not, it's the mer isomer. I, I can just see the faces better. I don't know why. Okay, let's look at another example. Can I move this up? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Actually, let's move, let's go back here. I got one more question for you. <laughs> um, what is the point group of these guys? Um, so, let's see. Or actually, maybe, maybe we're going to leave that one. Maybe we'll make a, we'll make the classroom assignment that way. We'll also have point groups in there. <laughs> Little reminder, refresher, get you ready for the final. Great. Um, as soon as they hit point groups, oh I just. Oh, no, because there's the. <laughs> oh, that's way more complicated than I thought it was going to be, actually. Yeah, it is. Okay, this guy, what's the name of it? Copper, or, well, I guess it would be. Is methylene diamine cobalt um, three? Methylene diamine cobalt. Are we gonna have to know all like the abbreviated names that are in the book? You don't have to know all of them, but you want to know common ones, like that one. <laughs> that one's a pretty common one. Yeah, I'll try my best yeah. to not put anything complicated. And if you're like, I don't know what that one is, but I know, uh, you can always ask and I can always tell you, yeah, I can or no, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's try and draw two possible isomers here. We're going to be a little lazy and we know that ethylene diamine looks like like that, right? But we're gonna represent it, and a lot of other people represent it, just that way. So we don't have to make distinct points. And it's okay. bit in this case because it connects twice to cobalt, correct? Yep. Okay. Oh, except this one isn't gonna work out. I was trying to do something different. This one, can you really get a face and a mer? Nope. You can't, you could only get a, like a, a trans. Well, no, I can't even do that. No, I didn't want to do that one, I'm sorry. Did what I wanted to do was this. All right. Yeah. 
That erases for a reason. I just didn't read well enough yet again. <laughs> so in this one, the ligand we're describing, oops. Is that there's not there's not a two there. So that's equal to di em, and we're going to um, we're going to represent it in the same kind of loopy way. We're just going to do that. Okay, so let's try to represent the two different ways. Okay, so we can see that the, the way that they're bound is a bit different, right? Anyone have an idea of which one is the face and which one's the myrrh? I assume that the left one is the face. Okay, we got one vote for the left one face. Anyone else gonna second it? I second it. Yeah, I see second a triangle it. there. All right, exactly. so got, the eyes have it. Yep, that one's the face. That guy's the murder. Whenever you stop to check us, I always think that we're wrong. <laughs> that's, that's why I do it. I just want to see if you, if you feel like you know it. Build up those confidence levels. Okay. Any questions about face and MERS? Your mind is hanging on a second, not moving that. <laughs> yeah, yep, I won't move it. Thank you. All right. Okay. Cool. Am I okay to move it up for everybody else now? Yeah. Okay. So now we can also have um, another complex that I want to look at. We can, we can have different kind of orientations, like pinwheels. If they're a C3 molecule, meaning a point group of C3, we can have clockwise and counterclockwise. So this is different from like R and S because we're yes, talking it about is. Right. Yep, different from R. Well, let's see. Kind of going to be the same, just like the amino acids are kind of the same. Mm -hmm. It's different than R and S because, like, you can they could be described with R and S, but we're specifying that they have this kind of pinwheel shape. So like. There are rhodocenes and other metal type ligands that have these kind of pad wheel orientation. So uh, these are complexes with two or more non adjacent chelating rings. Uh, which may be chiral. So we're going to consider, this is the one that I was thinking of earlier almost, 
that guy. And what's the name of this complex? This ethylene, nope, this. Triz, ethylene diamine. Not, not, not biz. Triz. Triz, yeah. And then what were you Ethylene to diamine, cobalt. Yeah. Three. Yep. Okay, so let's consider the, the different forms of that guy we can have. So we're going to draw them with kind of an orientation where we're looking with all the ligands kind of in the same, like a, a set of ligands above us and a set of ligands below us. <coughs> Bless you. Hey. So we can sort of see that paddle wheel look. So you can see that there are two kind of paddle wheel notations, one spinning clockwise, the other one spinning counterclockwise. So how do you determine which one's clockwise, which one's clockwise? So to determine clockwise, which we give the symbol delta and counterclockwise, which we give the symbol lambda. You follow these types of steps, or at least this is what I do. So you rotate molecules or complex where there are three atoms in the same plane. I guess this is where visualizing the apple comes in handy. Yeah, exactly. If you can <laughs> see the apple, you're good. If you can't, I don't know what to tell you. So this is traditionally how we look at octahedral complexes, right? So what we're going to do now is, is we're going to rotate that molecule. Basically what we've done is, is we've taken this molecule that's lying flat and we've rotated it like this. So we have to determine which nitrogens are connected to one another. So as we do it, these two are still going to be connected to each other. So let's label, let's label these guys. Oops. So we did like a C4 rotation, or how are we rotating it? We're rotating this 
like towards us like what is it probably like we're 30 like, degrees yeah we're we're rotating okay. like that gotcha hand like this moving that way so we, oh, I see. That makes sense. so let's see what atom becomes what so nitrogen one we've rotated it We we've done like a couple a couple different rotations. Yeah, but I see like what you're going for. So actually, let's say we spin it down. I've labeled these wrong already. These aren't necessarily the same labels. We'll do A B C D E F like that. Okay. One and six were connected, right? Can you tell me how the connection's going to be for this complex over here? Like what's A going to be connected to? Will that be connected to F? Yes. So, so A is connected to F. What is B connected to? C. Yep. And then we got the last one. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Now the next step is to draw faces on the atoms in the same plane. Draw faces on the atoms in the same plane. Okay, so we're going to draw our complex again, just this guy over again. Okay, now we want to draw lines on the same place. Or the same plane. Get this cool star symbol. Star of David, it looks like, I guess. <laughs> We're being religious. Yeah, religious institution. I mean, we got to talk about it a little bit. Like right? Frankincense and myrrh earlier. Okay. We're incorporating Jesus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> a good method over here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And now we look at that and we try and determine which way is this pinwheel going? Is it going clockwise or is it going counterclockwise? Remember the, the, purple, um, the purple triangle is deeper than the red triangle. So it's just to help you try and see a visualization. So, so how do we know how it's going to rotate though? That's, this is just a thread. <laughs> Oh, like how do we know which way is it going to rotate? Yeah, because I mean, if it's clockwise, you think turning clockwise and counter is like opposite. The, how can you tell that from a stationary kind of molecule? Oh, you gotta you gotta make the molecule spin in your head. Is the other part. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay, <laughs> which doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> so is water gonna blow out or away from? You? is essentially what we're trying to see. So, or air, if, if you think about it that way too. So there's a good picture kind of in your, your book, which I'm gonna step in front of this for a second, which shows you if it's like a right-handed or left-handed propeller. Uh, okay. okay. 
So clockwise is this isomer. It's going to have that kind of rotation to it. That kind of pad wheel. Those look identical. They no, are the dotted and dashed or slopped. Look at look at these two. Yeah. Or these two. Do you see so a the difference? The face there? is either like this or yeah. like this, kind of. I see what you're saying. Like it flips like a rudder. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So you're trying to figure out which way is it going to send water at you. Damn, I got a rudder on this thing. <laughs> okay. Oh. So let's hop back and let's try and look at ours. Okay. Let's try and draw a propeller associated with it. So how do they draw a propeller? Is this the one that we drew, is that clockwise? This one is clockwise. Okay. So what type of shape is it, or what type of, what symbol do we need for clockwise? Delta. Yeah, delta. Okay. And so it's going to kind of look like I drew it wrong. Oh. <laughs> it should have been more <laughs> symmetric. <laughs> no, no those should have been the same length. <laughs> well, like, I guess so, like each propeller oh. is whatever is made in between the bond that's coming out to you and then the mm -hmm. bond that's going back and then the line that you drew. So yeah. you like end up with like a propeller like this. So that if it's spun in the clockwise position, it would push water out. Yes. Okay. That's exactly it. Okay. So the counterclockwise one, we would label with a gamma, capital gamma, and it would look like this. Or actually, I'm going to have you guys tell me what it will look like in a second. Do we go to 11.15 or 11.20? 15. 15. This class always <laughs> seems to go by really quick for me. Probably feels like forever for you guys. Like for me, an hour and a half class. Yeah. So how would I connect, where would I connect to this nitrogen? Let me, let me label them real quick again. So where would I where would I connect A? Go to C. Yep. Where would I connect E? F. Yep. And then the last two. Okay, so let's try and draw a triangle that way. See, in my mind, when I look at this diagram, I think that this is clockwise. Because if I were to like put some kind of like force or water through it, like I would see it rotating clockwise. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. That makes, I see what you're saying, Josh. But think about it, if it was like pushing water at you, I think is like the idea here. Pushing water at us? Uh -huh. Because yes. I'm like, I'm so if you made water go through this, like, I get what you're saying. Technically, it would spin the opposite direction. If it was facing our direction and we shot it straight down, then it would go the opposite. But if it's coming up the other way, then yeah, I guess it would go. Uh -huh. How yeah. does it work in the opposite way than what you would think? It's all, <laughs> yeah. Have, have you been yeah. It's so hard to keep it straight, like, which way the paddle goes. <laughs> and then it's tough because then you're like, okay, I always ta taught myself it's the other way of what I'm thinking. So if yeah. I'm actually, yeah. 
Yeah, great. Great. Just never go paddle boarding. <laughs> paddle boarding always looks really fun, but it like hurts your ankles so bad after a while. <laughs> paddle boarding. <laughs> Okay, so sometimes these triangles help people visualize it better, sometimes they don't. For me, it helps, I can see it a little bit more, I can get more of a three-dimensional picture. It might be better to actually draw yeah. this out if you prefer that. This one's going to look better than my last one. That's a pretty good drawing. What, what or I guess you doing? could think about it blowing air if it was a fan. Like which one's actually going to blow the air towards you? I guess I'm not artistic because he looked the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. I just draw the same one. Yeah, I did. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Rough. Yeah, you did. <laughs> Darn. Try that again. <laughs> we'll do it here. Okay. Okay. We want. Oh, wait. I drew this one wrong. <laughs> That's why. This is meant to be that guy. And this one, we'll do it that way. That one's meant to be this one. There we go. Okay, so check out your book. There's a lot more pictures that can help you try and assess that, okay? Practice, WebMO can actually help out a ton with visualizing this too, if you need help seeing it in three dimensions, which I highly suggest to do. Normally we would work with um, molecular models to see differences, but due to circumstances, we can't get those. All right, are there any questions about what we covered today? No?